All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Rafael Medina subspecialty case discussion. Uh, the topic of today's session is pulmonary and critical care medicine. Um, my name is Maddie. I'll be facilitating the session, and I'm really excited for today's session because we have two um, pulmonary and critical care physicians here from UCSF, and we have Dr. Alex Smith, who will be presenting the case. Uh, so I'm first going to turn the mic over to Dr. Lakshmi Santosh and Dr. Alana Crum, who work together. So I'm actually going to ask them to introduce each other. And if they're if they're up for it, they can kind of share a story of an experience that they've had while working together. Uh, so maybe Dr. Crum, I can turn it over to you to introduce uh, Dr. Santosh. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm incredibly excited to be here. And it is my absolute honor to introduce the wonderful Dr. Santosh. So she is a associate professor in medicine uh, in both the division of hospital medicine and in pulmonary and critical care, and is an APD for both me in pulmonary and critical care, but also our amazing internal medicine residents, and has quite literally won more awards for all of the amazing work she does than I could possibly keep track of. Um, and I have had the great fortune of having her as a friend and a mentor. Um, she probably doesn't remember, but when we first got introduced, uh, it was via phone and it was supposed to be a five minute phone call, which turned into a 35 minute discussion of life and goals and careers and family. And I knew from then on that I would always have a fantastic friend and mentor. So it's just uh, such a joy to be here with her. That is so kind. Thank you so much, Dr. Crum. I'm very, very honored to introduce Dr. Crum, who I've been following from afar, even before she even knew me, uh, uh, when she was a resident and then chief resident at University of Washington. So we were really lucky to recruit her to UCSF for pulmonary critical care fellowship. And even during her residency and chief residency, she'd already made kind of national med ed recognition in the field of pulmonary and critical care medicine. I was familiar with her work through, we have kind of a sub-community called the Program Directors Association of Pulmonary Critical Care Medicine with the unpronounceable acronym of APCCMPD. So I'd already heard of this buzz. Dr. Crum is amazing, superstar, med ed candidate in pulmonary. She's a wizard. And we were so delighted to recruit her for UCSF. And at UCSF, she's actually one of our chief fellows. And she's going to be graduating this year and pursuing further subspecialty training in interventional pulmonary, which is a subspecialty of pulmonary critical care medicine. She also is currently in the middle of pursuing her master's of health professions education at Berkeley and is doing really innovative and exciting research in procedural education, particularly looking at you know, how do we teach others how to teach? How do we train the trainer? What are characteristics of great procedural educators? And lots of other interesting questions with a lot of really cool modalities, everything from quantitative, qualitative, um, 3D printing, and more. She too has won more awards and grants, med ed grants, as a fellow than any other fellow has ever won sort of at UCSF. She is truly a superstar and is already a national leader. And I, it's really my privilege and honor to be considered her mentor, but in one year she'll be in attending and then I can call her my peer mentor, which is how I genuinely view her. So I'm thrilled to be here to co-discuss this case with Dr. Crum. And then we've already decided we'll be referring to each other informally using our first names after this intro. Thanks again for the opportunity. Oh my gosh. Well, really just so grateful that both of you are here. And did you have a story that you guys wanted to share about a time you worked together at all? <laughs> um, I don't even know uh, if there's times that we could uh, uh, point to because we've overlapped in the ICU, in clinic, in research. And so um, there is, can't even point to like one particular clinical scenario, but I do know that we always get excited when we see each other in the hospital. It's a, it's a shout across the hall of, oh, hey. So um, I don't have one that comes to mind because it's just been a common thread through my training. Yeah, and I would just add that we, we kind of have a mentor-mentee mind meld 
where sometimes we're in the same meeting and we can just share a look and know what each other are thinking and then have you know a debrief afterwards which i'm sure will happen after our session today we've already planned our debrief so that's kind of we're on the same page and i'm her biggest fan <laughs> That's amazing. Well, maybe you guys can share looks across Zoom and um, share what you're thinking about the case today. <laughs> amazing. And then we have um, our case discussant today is Dr. Alex Smith, who is a chief resident at Hofstra Northwell and one of the CP Solvers team members and just such an amazing um, mentor and educator as well. So really grateful, Alex, that you're presenting the case. Did you want to unmute, um, introduce yourself a little bit more and share some of your interests? Sure. Thanks so much, Manny. So, uh, so like you said, I'm one of the chief residents at uh, the Tucker School of Medicine at the North Shore LIJ campuses, um, and I'm so excited to be presenting the case today. I actually just recently submitted my applications to Palmcrete Fellowship, uh, so hopefully moving on to Palmcrete Fellowship next year, and I'm excited to let you guys know how the application process goes. Yay, so exciting. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the case. Um, so Ricardo, you can go ahead and share your screen. And Alex, whenever you're ready, feel free to share the first aliquot. Sounds good. I'll give Ricardo a second. All right. So the case I have for you guys um, is of a 56-year-old man. He's presenting to clinic. So this, uh, this case presentation took place back in like April, May time. Um, and he was presenting just for a follow up visit. But he, the main thing that he wanted to discuss with us was a chronic cough that he had been having of, uh, of just over a year's duration. We followed him for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and for seasonal allergies. And he told us, uh, we had heard about this cough before. Um, but he told us that this cough had been persistent despite the treatments that we had offered him so far. Um, like I said, he did suffer from seasonal seasonal allergies, managed with uh, managed well with loratadine, although he had been taking it inconsistently. He also suffered from esophageal reflux um, that he had been managing with oral omeprazole, um, and also taking that inconsistently. Um, but he told us that the cough that he had been having had just been persistent over this past year, and uh, nothing, not really any better or worse, but um, persistent and and productive. So the Cough would happen various times throughout the day, several times a day, worse than first thing in the morning and worse at night when he was trying to sleep. He didn't have any shortness of breath accompanying that cough, uh, but he did produce some sputum associated with that cough. He had no history of cardiac disease. Despite his seasonal allergies, he never was formally diagnosed with asthma. Um, and he denied any other systemic symptoms, no fevers, no night sweats. He never had um, any nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And as far as he as far as he was uh, was sure, he hadn't had any unintentional weight loss or weight gain. Um, he hadn't had any recent changes to his medication regimen, and he didn't take any over-the-counter medications, no NSAIDs. Um, and that's just about it for the first aliqua. Amazing. Thanks, Alex. So um, Alana, maybe we'll turn to you for the first aliquot. And I'm curious, you know, in this 56-year-old man with a chronic cough, like how do you think about chronic cough in general in terms of differentials and management and um, how are you thinking about this case in particular? Yeah, absolutely. So chronic cough is totally a common thing we see in the clinic setting. And oftentimes we're thinking about first the common things, you know, common things being common with um, our gentleman here. He has some um, key features that kind of point to some of the common causes of cough. So the three major things I think of is for chronic cough, um, upper airway cough syndrome or um, post nasal drip, as people used to call it, um, acid reflux, GERD, um, or uh, cough variant asthma. And so, things that I'm thinking about with this patient, he already has two of the three of things that we know contribute to cough. So, even if there is another etiology, and you know, it's a morning report case, so it's probably not going to be upper airway cough syndrome but it still could be contributing regardless of the feature. And so um, other things that I'm thinking about that can help me with history, um, things like timing. So you said that worse in the morning, worse at night. So being supine, um, you know, can be your cough can be worse with GERD. Um, uh, you know, if there's any sort of worsening cough after eating makes you more think of GERD or dysphagia or um, other issues contributing to chronic cough. And then um, 
his allergy symptoms, uh, exploring that a little bit more. And of course, we're going to get more into the exposure history as well, um, or I would get into the exposure history as well to, to think of those wild and wonderful things that we also like to think about, but really starting with your basics and making sure those um, symptoms are well controlled from those common causes. I love that. Alana, you know, is clearly a skilled general pulmonologist before she gets her further training in interventional pulmonary. And I totally agree with what she said about the framework of the big three, GERD, upper airway cough syndrome, and cough variant asthma. I think a couple of quick things I would highlight with this patient in specific is I always want to know, you know, whether in a CPS or in clinic, sort of who is my host? Alana talked about exposures and we'll talk about social history, of course, tobacco, occupational history, environmental history, things like that. But I also like to know up front, is this sort of an immunocompromised host or immunocompetent host? Especially when I hear cough for over a year, that's not going away. I think about malignancy risk factors as well. And then some people have already brought up in the chat what I was thinking about too. Are we on any you know, ACE inhibitors or drugs that might be a common cause of chronic cough as well? Another thing that he's a little bit young for, but we, again, we don't know much about his status as a host that I do think about is aspiration. So Alana talked about how we think about timing of the cough as being helpful. So asking about, does it occur after solids, liquids, both, things like that. Those are just a couple of things I would add to this excellent conversation so far. Fantastic teaching. Thank you both. All right, Alex, back to you for the next aliquot. All right, so a little bit more history for him. Um, so uh, I know we asked a little bit about age-appropriate cancer screening. He did get a screening colonoscopy um, uh, about about five years ago, and there were there were no lesions identified. In terms of past medical history, I shared with you guys already that he suffers from hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes mellitus, GERD, um, and seasonal allergies. He has no known surgical history. He does have a family history of oropharyngeal cancer in his mother. In terms of his social history, he has never smoked uh, tobacco. He's never used any any illicit substances. He's never uh, never consumed alcohol. He does live um, at home alone in, at home alone in Queens, and he was born and raised here in the United States. He's uh, and he denies any any recent foreign travel. Um, he works as a in manual labor for an air conditioning company. He denies any exposure, as far as he's aware, to um, like wood burning ovens or, or, or fumes. Um, in terms of medications that he takes, so he he does take um, the, he does take pantobrazole forty milligrams daily, atorvastatin forty milligrams daily, fluticasone uh, two sprays in each nostril twice daily. He takes losart losartan twenty five milligrams daily, and and that's uh, been consistent. He never was on um, an ACE inhibitor, always on the angiotensin receptor blocker. He takes loratadine ten milligrams daily, metformin a thousand milligrams twice daily. And he takes no other over-the-counter medications and no supplements. In particular, he denied any NSAIDs or aspirin. Um, in terms of his seasonal allergies, so so like I said, this uh this case presentation to us was in um, April May time here in here in New York, um, and he said that his uh um but he denied any any medication any uh, any allergies to any medications or to anything other than um, just kind of hay fever in the environment as far as he could tell us. And then in terms of his, go ahead. The what do you think, Benny? Should we, the I was thinking maybe vitals and physical exam. Then we'll stop there. That's perfect. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So in terms of vitals, uh, temperature in the clinic was ninety eight, measured orally. Heart rate seventy five. Blood pressure one twenty three over seventy five, and his oxygen saturation was ninety nine percent in room air. His BMI was twenty nine. At a, at a weight of about 185 pounds. And notably, although he had denied in terms of history any any known weight loss or weight gain, we, we did notice that he lost about 35 pounds of weight over the past two years or so just per vital sign trends in our clinic. And then in terms of his exam, um, he was uh, breathing comfortably in no acute distress uh, he was, and otherwise appeared well. He didn't have uh, any rashes in the in the elbow creases or any um, he didn't have any any um, rhinorrhea or any coryza that we could appreciate on exam. Um, there wasn't any wasn't any any erythema in the back of his throat, and his oral exam was otherwise normal. 
he was clear to our auscultation bilaterally. There was no wheezing and no rouse either. He had a normal S1, S2. And his abdomen was non-tender, non-distended. And otherwise, his extremities were, were warm and well perfused. Um, and he had a grossly intact neurologic exam. And maybe I'll stop there. Perfect. Well, maybe Lakshmi, we can start with you this time. And I'm curious how this additional information is impacting your differential. And you you both talked about kind of the three most common causes. And do you think this is consistent with the three most common causes or does something about the additional information kind of push you away from those? Great question. So as you know, we pulmonologists, we love our social history and our exposure history. So a couple of things stand out to me. One, we heard that the patient is a non-smoker, but we also know that they have a first degree relative with oropharyngeal cancer. And oropharyngeal cancers are often, you know, squamous cell carcinomas that are often related to tobacco smoke as well. So I always ask about secondhand smoke exposure in addition to kind of were they a primary smoker or not. So that, th that stuck out to me. Of course, people are honing in the chat about this intriguing history of working in manual labor for an air conditioning company. That is one of those professions that we think of as a high risk factor for asbestos related exposure. So plumbing, shipyard, air conditioning, um, certain types of manufacturing, those are ones where we definitely want to hone in specifically on what exposures they've experienced we specifically often ask in our clinic, were you exposed in your work to gases, fumes, dusts, or odors? Kind of that catchphrase. And often fellows will just rattle that off really quickly when they're giving oral presentations. So I will ask them specifically about that. And also ask, are there other chemicals or gases that maybe we don't even know about that they would be exposed to in addition to asbestosis triggering in my head? Um, I also heard a great social history, but just for thoroughness, pulmonologists, we do love to ask about pets and birds as well. When thinking about hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, again, I think that's less likely here, but we always ask it to be thorough. And then in terms of medications, you know, you pointed out that they were never on an ACE, just on an ARB. One quick tool to outline to you all is pneumotox.com www.pneumotox.com, which is a great resource to look if any of the medications are associated with any kind of lung disease. It's a free resource. And I love it because it not only gives you a differential, but it also actually links to the specific case reports or case series of the primary literature. So you can say, hey, I actually found this one case where there is a very rarely an ARB can be associated with a chronic cough, you know, things like that rather than just saying, I heard that. So it's a, it's a nice source of the primary literature. In the physical exam, a couple of things are sticking out as well. This weight loss is definitely concerning. Again, we do think about tobacco smoke and asbestos smoke as being multiplicative risk factors for malignancy. That's another key teaching point. So tobacco increases your risk for lung cancers, asbestos related increases your risk, but together it's, it's a multiplicative risk. It's extremely high risk. So I worry about that when I hear about weight loss and possible asbestos exposure. Malignancy is definitely on my don't miss or can't miss differential here. The normal oxygen saturation is reassuring, but a quick test that we do in pulmonary clinic is a six minute walk test as well to make sure that they're oxygenating well at both rest and on exertion. And then the normal lung exam is good too. In the extremities, I always make a plug to look for clubbing as well. So, you know, we get the warm and well perfused and no edema, but always take a look for clubbing in our pulmonary patients as well. Um, I think that the labs and imaging are going to be really helpful for us here to think about what other processes might be involved. And I'm really excited to see what they'll show. Anything to add, Alana? I think you covered all of the major things that I was thinking about. Um, again, with his occupational history, yes, asbestosis, I think, sprung out to everybody. But we also have to think about, you know, folks who are working in um, specifically the AC industry are also at risk for pneumoconiosis. So actually kind of diving down and seeing what his um, actual occupation was. I've had someone who um, remodeled, remodeled the fittings and was actually exposed to um, metal uh, shavings and and welding. And so you can have exposures from that standpoint. And then also asking him about his cough. Is it worse at um, when he's at work or is it worse caught continuously it can help us give him uh, an idea of, of narrowing down that exposure history, but also 
uh, the imaging and the, the labs will be incredibly helpful. Um, and I do um, remember a pearl that I was given um, when I was a resident about unintentional weight loss. And um, uh, I was always told, and this was borne out in clinical practice for me, that unnoticed weight loss is more concerning than noticed weight loss. So really that 35 pound loss that our patient wasn't aware of really makes us worried about malignancy, though we, we don't want to anchor and we want to keep our differential broad at this point. Wow, fantastic teaching points. Um, I had, I just wanted to go back to, uh, Lexi, one of the things you were saying about, you know, we don't see clubbing here, but that's something that you would look for. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what would clubbing signal to you if you were to see that on the exam? So clubbing is nonspecific, but it's an additional physical exam finding that could be associated with malignancy, could be associated with obstructive lung disease, but it can also be associated with non-pulmonary processes, including IBD, liver disease as well. But if I had clear lungs, no hypoxemia, and clubbing with this lung cancer history, it just increases that pretest probability even more, but the absence of clubbing certainly does not rule it out. All right, perfect, thank you. All right, Alex, back to you. All right, so maybe I'll just uh, provide a few clarifying points before jumping into the next aliquot. Um, so the in terms of his mother's oropharyngeal cancer history, as far as he knew, she she was a non-smoker, so that he denied any secondhand smoke exposure in, in his home growing up. Um, and then in terms of uh, the exams, so no clubbing, like you guys said, um, I think there was a, one more clarifying point I was going to provide, but that's okay. We'll come back to it if I remember. Then in terms of labs, so as for his CBC, his white blood cell count was 9.19. Um, but notably, he had 13.2% EOs. So that came out to an, a total eosinophil count of about, uh, of about 1.2 thousand. His hemoglobin was 14.4. And matter it was 44.8. Platelets 253. Then as for um, his BMP, his sodium was 137, potassium 4.8, chloride 100, bicarb 25, BUN 17, creatinine 0 0.85, and glucose 102. And then as for the rest of his complete metabolic panel, so his calcium was 9.9, .9, total protein 7.6, albumin 4.7, total bilirubin 0 0.2, AST 27, ALT 21, and alpha 66. And then a few more studies I'll give for this Alec bot. He had... Um, Shortly after this visit, he had a few other studies sent. So an HIV uh, test was negative. He had strongyloides antibodies that were also negative. Um, a stool O&P was negative. ANCAs were negative. Um, and he had a serum immunofixation and his, his total serum IG was with, uh, within normal limits. And that's it for the Salakot. All right. So Alana, maybe we'll turn to you first uh, this time. And curious, um, out of all this data in particular, kind of the elevated eosinophil count, how are you thinking about that in the context of this patient's chronic cough? Yeah. So I mean, everyone gets excited about elevated EOs and some of the studies that we, we already received are kind of evidence of people exploring that. Um, and, you know, pulmonologists, we, we always get excited about elevated EOs for sure. Um, so, so, you know, there's a huge number of things that can cause uh, elevated eosinophilia, including just normal things, right? We see folks with really severe asthma who have elevated EOs um, or significant allergic disease at baseline. We also think about things like collagen vascular diseases, um, and uh, the neoplasms themselves can cause elevated eosinophils. And then, um, uh, you know, the parasitic infections, I see the Strangi was sent, is also something we think about. Um, and so um, 
I think the initial evaluation with some of these studies are totally um, appropriate and what I would have thought of too. I think also um, imaging can be helpful too because you know what the pulmonary, if there are pulmonary infiltrates that can help narrow us down as well. Um, people get really excited about sending sort of uh this the parasitic workup but this travel history um kind of makes the weird and wonderfuls a little less exciting and so we have to think about the things like the malignancies collagen vascular disease so again his age is is um uh, and lack of other symptoms make it uh, would make it a atypical presentation of primary pulmonary but um it's totally possible um so i'll pause there And the only thing I would add to Alana's excellent list and differential is those are kind of what we classically think about as kind of secondary causes of eosinophilia, which is distinct from the primary eosinophilic diseases, which is more of the like acute eosinophilic pneumonia, um, hyper eosinophilic syndromes, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, which are all very, very rare. So again, I often, when, when you're approaching a large differential in morning report, you'll often anchor it back to what about this patient, right? So in this patient, I totally agree with Alana that neoplasm is still very high on my list because that is what's kind of the highest pretest probability by our history and physical exam and can give you eosinophilia. And the only other thing I would mention is to think about in somebody with pre-existing asthma, thinking about ABPA, if you see somebody with worsening asthma or worsening cough and eosinophilia. So I think the imaging will be really critical here as well as um, you know, further workup for eosinophilic processes, much of which has already been done. I wouldn't go on a wild goose chase, just as Alana said, because this is an immunocompetent host, as far as we know, who hasn't traveled or hasn't had any other significant exposures. Um, the pneumoconioses, they can sometimes give you a very low, you know, a little middling eosinophilia, but not a very high eosinophilia, like 13.2%. And that's something that I would, again, look up, right? I would say, hey, in the in the cases that, in the times that I've encountered pneumoconioses, I don't associate them with a rip-roaring eosinophilia. Is there an overlap between eosinophilia and a certain pneumoconiosis? I would have to look that up, but malignancy is still highest for me, given these data points that we have. Yeah, I really love how you both um, really kind of anchored yourselves and anchored your thinking like the base rate and didn't kind of jump to the rare things. One follow-up question I had is both of you talked about how neoplasms are, are pretty high on your differential. I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit on like what what type of neoplasms in particular um, are you thinking about with this eosinophilia and chronic cough? I would say it's non-specific, you know, okay. and so I think Again, when I think about neoplasms of the lung, I always divide it up into primary lung malignancy versus secondary, something that's metastatic to the lung. And then I also always think about blood cancers. You know, people are invoking in the chart, leukemias and lymphomas. We have an SPEP that I heard was normal. Um, and then, you know, there doesn't seem to be a markedly elevated globulin gap or anything like that. But I always divide up malignancy when we're talking about lungs to primary lung, metastatic to the lung, or blood cancers, leukemias, lymphomas, thinking about that. So it can be nonspecific. Great, thank you. All right, Alex, back to you. All right, so as requested, I will share some imaging. Um, Ricardo, is it okay if I share my screen for a second just to show some image? Sure. So let me see if I can expand this a little bit. Uh, so right here I have his chest x-ray. And then let me know when I'm okay to, to show you guys some representative images from his chest CT. So I don't have the, the full video of his chest CT here, unfortunately, but I do have a few representative slices. Yeah. 
yes, interpreting images over Zoom is <laughs> challenging when you can't scroll and change all, all the different settings. So um, Lakshmi or Alana, if you want to kind of take a stab at any initial thoughts that are going through your mind when you're seeing this image, normal, abnormal. So I, I would just go ahead, Alana. Oh, I just, I can't tell if it's blurry on my screen or not. Um, so so major caveat. And um, whenever you see, especially radiologists, but pulmonologists also going through CT scans, you'll see constant scrolling. Um, because again, right, determining do we have, is that an airway? Is that a cyst? Is that a blood vessel? What's abnormal is really helpful when you're trying to put these 2D slices actually into 3D to try and rebuild it. Um, I will say that the chest x-ray, um, there was, it was a little hard to tell, um, if there was some hyalur fullness or not. Oftentimes it can get overcalled, but there was nothing. And, and like, maybe there's some, um, again, but this is a little, maybe a little blurry over zoom. Like maybe there's a little more fullness than I would expect, but there's obviously no like huge consolidation that I see on, on, um, on chest x-ray. And so on CT scan, again be, caveat it's a little blurry it looks relatively clear at the apices um and then as we go down i wonder if there's like a little airway um dilatation and thickening a little bit that i can see that makes me worried about um, you know some chronic inflammation but it's a little caveat hard for me because I, I really want to scroll um uh, to see if I'm seeing some dilated airways at the bases. Totally agree. Again, we just, we really need our scrolling and all the views and even the video is hard, right? Because we really want to scroll up and down because as Lana said, a teaching point is that, um, you know, for the novice viewer that airways and blood vessels and nodules are all going to show up you know, blood vessels and nodules are all going to show up as quote white and so we actually follow up follow out the airways from the 2d image to extrapolate to a 3d image to say hey is that a nodule or just a blood vessel scrolling through so that makes it tricky um i'll call out the pertinent negatives i'm looking for because whenever i'm looking at imaging i'm looking with my systematic approach of course but i'm also also looking with my prioritized differential and pertinent positives and negatives, right? So pertinent negatives, both on the chest x-ray and on the chest CT, I don't see a rip-roaring giant mass with a raging consolidation or a post-obstructive pneumonia or an endobronchial lesion causing distal obstruction like I would have expected for a malignancy, for example. So that's something that I was worried about that I didn't quite see. Um, I also didn't really see, you know, people asked about atelectasis. I don't really see atelectasis or lung collapse. People asked about fibrosis. This looks like it's a uh, kind of a regular CT. Technically, to rule out fibrosis exclusively, you would need a high resolution chest CT with expiratory reviews. That uh, expiratory views, we look for that when we're thinking about, you know, exposures, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, things like that. And what what I do see, I totally agree with Alana is. It's hard to tell if there might be some nonspecific central lobular nodules um, it, with surrounding maybe some very mild airway impaction um, and mild bronchiectasis. So I would definitely scroll down, walk down to my chest radiologist, always great to walk down and discuss with them in person the history particularly. Uh, but those are some of the pertinent negatives that I'm thinking about. And I'll also add that with parasitic infections that people are throwing in the chat, often this, the, the imaging findings are quite nonspecific, like a couple of nodules here and there. One of the great cases that I had from the first week of fellowship was actually um, July 4th weekend, we had a patient with pulmonary strongy and the chest CT was quite unimpressive with again, maybe a couple of little central lobular nodules, but nothing really impressive. And it was actually the sputum culture that showed live worms. So a quick plug also for the sputum culture. I think another question that often comes up at this point, point in time is, um, quote, to bronch or not to bronch. And, 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 you know, Alana and I might touch on that. And I always think about when we're thinking about that question, I think about two things, sort of can we and should we? Can we? Uh, I think about what are the kind of contraindications to the procedure? Are they medically going to tolerate the procedure? Seems like, you know, he's hemodynamically stable. He's not on any oxygen. He's not 
you know, hypotensive and shock, things like that, he doesn't have a rapidly declining trajectory. So we could, uh, and then the should we is the other question of what is the diagnostic test that's going to be kind of the highest yield in this patient? And what am I looking for? What are the pretest probabilities? Things like that. And so in this patient first, I'd want a solid chest radiology conversation before invoking a bronchoscopy. And again, I also am thinking about triage, right? So this is an outpatient where we've ruled out some scary things pretty acutely. And this is somebody where we, I, I, I as pulmonologists would definitely want some PFTs as well to see how they're doing in terms of their lung function. But I wouldn't necessarily jump or rush to bronchoscopy in this case, unless there's something in the imaging that's really necessarily focal that needs a biopsy. I would first proceed with the non-invasive steps like sputum cultures, um, you know, talking to chest radiology, sputum cultures, PFTs, a little bit more history before diving into invasive procedures. I love the can we and should we framework for bronchoscopy. That's fantastic. Um, Alex, did you really have... for any invasive procedure? Yeah, right? so it's like a for any, for we do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Alex, did you have a kind of a read on any of these images you want to share? Sure thing. And, and I totally apologize for not having the the ability to kind of scroll back and forth. I know it's challenging with Zoom. Um, the like you guys said, I, the the chest X ray was 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 negative. They didn't even they didn't interpret the the hyalur fullness that you guys had. Um, the chest CT there was a there was a small uh, three millimeter nodule in the in the right middle lobe, um, which I, I know we can't adequately identify on the just these like just these few screenshots since we can't scroll up or down. Um, but other than that, the 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 chest CT, which uh, um, like you guys said was was not high resolution, was uh, was interpreted as otherwise normal. And maybe Alex, for the second time, you can move on to kind of the next set of, of data that you had. It's as requested. I do have some spirometry. Is it okay if I show the PFT results on here too? Sounds good. Right. So let me see if maybe I can. So this and was our low volume loop. And then. Uh, I have our spirometry numbers down here in our DLCO. I can zoom in on that, or if you guys can read it, let me know. And Alana, maybe we'll turn to you first. I know the text is, <laughs> is small, so if you're able to see it, um, but especially for kind of our earlier stage learners, like it'd be really helpful if you could kind of highlight in a structured way, like how you go through PFTs and um, what value specifically you find the most helpful. Sure. So first thing that I look at is actually the shape of the loop, um, because uh, it can give you a sense of, is this super abnormal or is this going to be more subtle? And I won't go into like the nuances of the different shapes, but that's usually where I start, um, because often it'll give you the predicted values on the loops and you can say, is this totally abnormal and should I be worried? Um, the, the shape of the curve was not super crazy, so we won't have to go over that. But um, then I look at our um, spirometry. So that um, is first you look at your, um, or at least I first look at my FEV1 to FVC ratio. So FEV1, how much air you blow out in the first second, FVC, how much air you blow out total. And then you look at how those two compare. And so the, the cutoff that we use is 0.7, um, which our, uh, patient is like right at the cusp, um, which is classic for patients. They never, you know, fall nicely into one category or the other. So by technical definition, we, we by FEV1 to FEC ratio, you would say they technically don't meet obstruction. Um, uh, so, but it, it, there's a little nuance to that. But I still look at our FEV1 and our FEC specifically, and I see that um, both of those are reduced. So they're both in the 60% predicted. So if I had no other information, I would say, hmm, do I actually have a restrictive uh, ventilatory defect? But fortunately we have our um, actual lung volumes here. And by lung volumes, we look at our TLC, total lung capacity. And actually that's 80% predicted. So technically that's normal. Um, and, and so, you know, there's some nuances that we can look in through there, but 
But one of the things that is highlighted for me specifically is that RV, which is residual volume, how much volume is left um, when you blow out, is 130% predicted. So it means that there's a lot of air trapping going on, um, which is interesting to me and, um, and uh, is something that I definitely want to think about. Um, and then the, the next thing that I look at, so we looked at our spirometry, we looked at our vol lung volumes, um, spirometry for obstruction, lung volumes for restriction, um, and then our diffusing capacity, that DLCO, which is basically trying to measure the surface area for gas exchange that you have in your lungs. And our surface area for that gas exchange, our DLCO is reduced in this um, in this uh, PFT. And so things that can cause a reduced DLCO um, you can have uh, intraparenchymal things like our pulmonary fibrosis, so that doesn't make sense for the CT scan per se. Um, you can have also emphysematous changes, which we didn't see a huge amount of emphysematous changes, and we didn't have a lot of obstruction on our spirometry, so that doesn't quite make sense. And then other things we think about also is our uh, pulmonary vascular disease that can also cause reduced DLCO. Um, one caveat here is that DLCO, um, we often correct for um, hemoglobin, so if this wasn't corrected, and they have a rip roaring anemia, which you didn't have, um, then that can trick you up as well. But that's kind of the, the first pass run through that I think about for pulmonary function testing. That was phenomenal. Thank you so much. I feel like I've uh, PFTs can get very confusing, but that was so clear, so clearly described. So <laughs> amazing teaching there. And Lakshmi, what anything else you would add about how you approach PFTs and what stood out to you. Yeah, I love Alana's approach to the PFT. That's kind of the classic UCSF teaching. And I think a great resource, there's two great resources that I'd point out. One is actually, there was just a piece published in ATS Scholar, which is kind of our ATS meta journal on kind of how to interpret PFTs and how to teach interpretation of PFTs. I'll drop that link in the chat shortly. And then of course, there's the ATS guidelines on how to interpret PFTs, which has a nice algorithm as well. So I'll drop both those links in the chat. And I totally agree with Alana's interpretation that it's like a slightly curvilinear flow volume loop, but technically by numbers, no evidence of obstruction, no evidence of restriction, um, and a mildly decreased DLCO is kind of the summative approach, the, the summary I would say here. And then how do I contextualize that with the chest CT and the symptoms? So we heard that the final rate of the chest CT, you know, we pulmonologists were squinting to find things that weren't there, but the final chest CT was essentially normal, except for a three millimeter, three millimeter lung nodule. And just a quick teaching point on that, because patients come to us all the time with a panic in my chart message, or even a full consult with this three millimeter lung nodule that was incidentally found. Um, just to note that we use the Fleischner criteria when we look at evaluating lung nodules, and this patient is a um, has never smoked before. And so in somebody with low risk factors, has never smoked before, any nodules less than six millimeters are very, very low likely to be malignant. So I would reassure that patient and the Fleischner criteria, which you know really follows nodules out over time, with thousands of data points, hundreds of thousands of data points really reassures us that that's most likely going to be benign and actually doesn't need follow-up interval imaging either. In fact, most medical centers won't even report out on their chest radiology nodules less than six millimeters for that reason. Our institution does, um, and a lot of institutions do, but just so you know, that magic number to remember is six millimeters in a no-risk individual. So, you know, when I see and this is a really common consult. I mean, Alon and I have this in clinic all the time where we see a patient with chronic cough, um, studies are reassuringly negative, and there might be some like tiny signals here and there, but we have not uncovered kind of a smoking gun per se. Um, a lot of things, a lot of times diagnostically too, tincture of time helps a little bit to see how the patient is doing over time. For me, what's unresolved in this case is that 35 pound weight loss. I'm not feeling that diagnostic closure. I do not feel like we have a solid explanation for what's causing a 35 pound unintentional weight loss in this individual. And that's still really concerning to me. And so that's something that I would work up more. Um, another teaching point about PET scans and nodules is that I wouldn't recommend a PET scan to follow up that lung nodule per se, uh, because a PET scan really only helps when nodules are really greater than about nine millimeters to 10 millimeters in size. Will they light up as a PET scan showing up as malignant? 
But I would go back and say, you know, what is your age appropriate malignancy screening? Thinking about our unintentional weight loss frameworks, thinking about that. So for me, that's quite unresolved. The chronic cough I've ruled out, um, you know, at least a lung primary or metastatic to the lung disease. Uh, definitively, we've had some basic eosinophilia workup that's negative, but I'm still left with a middle-aged man with a chronic cough with a 35 pound unintentional weight loss and eosinophilia. So we are not quote done diagnostically. Yeah, I love that. All right, Alex, where, um, where was the team's head at at this point and what did they do next? So admittedly, I don't have a lot of diagnostic closure for this case just yet. Um, the, but I will say that the, so, the, so this was a couple of months ago um, and we unfortunately have, haven't really been able to get this gentleman back to, to clinic just yet. Um, but we did send him over to, um, to, to pulmonology and to hematology in the hopes that they would, uh, that pulmonology would do a, a sputum culture, like you guys had suggested and a, a sputum looking for eosinophils in the sputum. Um, and we also, uh, given the, the negative work of thus far for the eosinophilia, the, although we have, um, otherwise negative chests, uh, chest CT so far out of suspicion that maybe we could have had like a, a chronic eosinophilic bronchitis that hadn't otherwise come to to clinical light just yet. Um, we were looking for causes for the for the chronic eosinophilia, um, uh, particularly primary causes. So the uh, we were asking that hematology might do a blood smear, um, look at uh, like the drug drive growth factor uh, mark, cellular markers to see if the patient might have a like an an uh, like a subclinical eosinophilic leukemia um, that may have explained this weight loss and the eosinophilia and the and the pulmonary findings. And unfortunately, we don't have those data just yet, but hopefully, we do soon. Thank you, Alex, for sharing kind of the information that you had. And Lakshmi, maybe I'll turn it over to you and then and then Alana next. Kind of how um, you know, in this patient who had Lakshmi, I feel like you summarized it really well um, in the last aliqua, in this person with chronic cough, with eosinophilia, with this weight loss, who doesn't have, you know, a complete kind of this is your diagnosis. Like, how would you navigate kind of the management um of that in this person? It's a great question. I think there, there would be some strategic follow-up tests, consults, and tincture of time that I would approach. In terms of follow-up tests, I'm definitely thinking about getting an IgE. When I see somebody with hyper eosinophilia, I also want an IgE, or really a full immunoglobulin panel before going down the, the, the rabbit hole of like a lot of diagnostic tests for rare parasites. But an IgE and a full immunoglobulin panel would be one thing to think about. I would also repeat the labs over time to see, is that eosinophilia rising, falling, staying the same? You know, if it's rapidly escalating, another strategic consult that I might place in this case is to both, you know, you mentioned hemonc, but also allergy immunology in this case. They can provide a lot of light on the primary eosinophilic disorders that I mentioned. So we talked a lot about the secondary causes, but for the primary causes, particularly with the immunoglobulins in hand, that might be helpful. Um, I would talk about, again, age-appropriate malignancy screening really rigorously in this person. I love the idea of a smear. You know, we don't see any cytopenias to warrant a bone marrow biopsy or anything like that. So I wouldn't go for that invasive test yet, but definitely a smear, you know, smear LDH to start with, immunoglobulins to start with. Um, and then because of the, because of his, you know, this is something that's like more of a subtle fellow level teaching point that we talk about, but Alana and I deal with this a lot in clinic where the, the trust CT has ruled out some dangerous causes. The PFTs are largely normal, but there is a slight curvilinear flow volume loop. Sometimes we might even do kind of a short empiric trial of a um, essentially mild intermittent asthma therapy, given the slight curvilinear flow volume loop to say, hey, is this a very mild ver version of cough variant asthma, mild obstructive lung disease? Will they get symptomatic benefit from some therapy for mild intermittent asthma? And the first line therapy of that, and a teaching point here is that for decades, the first line therapy was albuterol, but the newer guidelines actually recommend that the first line therapy is actually now a LABA ICS PRN, so long-acting beta agonist inhaled corticosteroid PRN. I think that might be kind of diagnostic and therapeutic to try for, again, a short course, 
short course trial with a short-term follow-up to see did the patient's symptoms change at all? Did they get better or worse? And to see how the eosinophilia tracked with that. So prednisone, systemic prednisone, should knock down your EOs usually to zero right, right away. Um, but then inhaled corticosteroids don't usually do that. Rarely inhaled corticosteroids, especially when very heavily overused, can have systemic effects. And I've definitely seen the rare patient in my practice who's had frank adrenal insufficiency actually from inhaler use. That's quite rare though. So the inhaler shouldn't change the eosinophilia. So, um, and if they do, again, you're wondering if something else is going along. Um, some people might ask sort of, quote, what's the harm of treating with an empiric pulse of steroids in this case. And, you know, in at UCSF, I would say that we're, we're a little bit, uh, we're of the school of thought of, you know, value-based care and do no harm. So we don't do a lot of empiric prednisone in these cases. I feel like, and I think about the benefits and risks of that decision. So the benefit is you could see what happens to the eosinophils, but I predict it's going to go down. You could see if they get better. But to me, the risk is, and I see this a lot of times with second opinions, is that the person feels, quote, better on prednisone, but you still don't have a diagnosis and you have unresolved uh, diagno diagnoses. And now the patient says, you know, I feel better on prednisone. Why are you, why are you kind of withholding that treatment from me? So I, my practice in general is to not do empiric prednisone unless I suspect strongly a steroid responsive process. And in this case, I don't have a clear steroid responsive process to hang my hat on. So because we, this is not an emergency, we have time, we've ruled out a lot of things, I would proceed with those additional tests that I outlined, a couple of additional consults that I outlined, and then follow this person up closely to see what happens, and then to see, do we need to proceed to more invasive diagnostic tests? Um, anything to add, Alana? No, I think that's great. I think it's just important to highlight that if we removed that 35 pound weight loss over the past two years, I think that would shift our framework about how we're thinking about this patient, right? I think then, um, you know, someone with some relatively normal PFTs or chronic cough, everything else otherwise stable and some elevated eosinophils, one could say, oh, this is probably just a little bit of obstructive airway disease, asthma, let's start ICS for Motorola and see how they do. But that one key history point of that 35 pound weight loss is really one of those things that is a trigger and a red flag to say, we really want to make sure that we're not missing anything, which is why Electra is highlighting that even if we do trial I, you know, um, uh, ICS for Motorol to empirically treat, we would really want to follow them up closely because that's, um, that's unsatisfactory to explain this 35 pound weight loss. Yeah, it is so fascinating how kind of that one additional history point really kind of changes how we're thinking about the person and how concerned we are about additional workup. Um, Alex, do you have any kind of final thoughts you wanted to share about um, your process kind of going through this patient's case or anything you want to share to wrap up? Just had one question for you guys. So the um, I really like the idea of the the possibility of empiric treatment for for asthma. I guess I'm trying to conceptualize that in, in the context of my my admitted elementary understanding of the PFTs and that we don't have a, a bronchodilatory response. Um, so I was I was wondering if one or both of you guys might be able to comment on that. Yeah. So um, a couple things about PFTs and a couple things about asthma. So asthma by itself is. Um, uh, variable, right? That's one of the hallmarks, right? Folks will come in and say, during springtime, my asthma is terrible. Wintertime, I'm fine. Or conversely, or I just got a cat and my asthma is horrible. So depending on when you catch that individual, dictates what their PFTs look like. You can have someone with really terrible asthma that's well controlled and their PFTs can be entirely normal. And the same goes for the bronchodilator response. And we actually know that the absence of bronchodilator response does not mean that they won't derive benefit from therapy. And so it has to be a really um, a major caveat. One of the big learning points I've had with PFTs through fellowship is that they are not definitive. They really have to be interpreted with a grain of salt and we get in trouble if we anchor too much on that. So that's a great question. Totally agree. And I think the, the additional point to add to Alana's excellent teaching here on PFTs being static, right? It's a static picture, one snapshot in time, is that 
you could have patients with asthma that have no bronchodilator reactivity, and you could also have patients with COPD with wild bronchodilator reactivity. So this is one of these things that um, the more specialized we go in training, the more we see that the patients don't read the textbook. And that's an important teaching point that I share with primary care uh, providers and uh, generalists often is we got to put that PFT in context, just as Alana said. Well, thank you both so much for truly this excellent teaching. And as I've said before, really admire how you really anchored yourselves and kind of what's most common and um, the factors that would increase kind of further testing or not. Um, before, in like kind of the last three minutes, I was wondering if I could turn to each one of you and if you could share kind of two key teaching points you'd want to leave um, everyone listening to this with. Um, so maybe Alana, we'll start with you. What two teaching points did you want to highlight for us all? Sure, I think, um... I'll highlight kind of what we just addressed for pulmonary function testing is that they're just a snapshot in time and have to be interpreted in clinical context. And they can provide information and support, but they shouldn't be our only um, only thing to hang your hat on because there's a lot of caveats. And um, for those of you who I saw some chatter in the uh, chat of how confusing PFTs are, I would say the other thing is use that ATS guide for interpretation. It can be really helpful. There's a flow chart that walks you through it. So um, PFTs are hard and there's some great resources to help you out with them. Amazing. And Lakshmi, did you have one or two teaching points you wanted to highlight before we end? Yeah, I think one, one teaching point that I would highlight is again, when it comes to any of these problems, thinking about one meta, metacognitive teaching point is when you think about all these problems, thinking about not just your differential, but your prioritized differential for this patient in front of you. So I often see in morning report, people will rattle off like, this is this is my framework for eosinophilia, or this is my framework for chronic cough. But then I encourage you all to go that extra step to say, and in this patient, I think this is more likely. In this patient, I think this is less likely and why. So that's kind of the metacognitive or clinical reasoning teaching point that I would leave you with. And I hope that in our discussion, we did share with you a couple of other little pearls to add about exposure history. So going beyond the no TAD, no tobacco, alcohol, drugs, but thinking about occupation, what exactly are they doing in that occupation? Like Alana said, pets, birds, gases, vapors, dust, fumes, primary smoke exposure, as well as secondhand smoke exposure. We didn't talk about it today, but I always explicitly ask about e-cigarettes and vaping as well, in addition to primary smoking. So hopefully you learned a little bit more about rounding out the social history. And then the last teaching point I would say is that, um, you know, both Alana and I practice in both outpatient and inpatient settings. And I think most, most specialists practice in, in both settings and thinking about that often when you do this diagnostic workup in the outpatient setting, yes, Yes, you'll find a little bit satisfying that you can't just pan scan them head to toe if they were inpatient, but often those seeing those people over time, seeing what is that weight loss doing? What is that eosinophilia doing? That itself is a diagnostic clue to, to follow these things closely over time. As challenging as it sometimes can be, it can also be very rewarding. Thanks for having us. Amazing. Thank you both so much. Really, it's such a rich discussion. And Alex, thank you so much for preparing this case in um, such a kind of really thoughtful and thought-provoking way. Uh, so thank you all so much. Shout out to Ricardo for scribing and Jimena for the amazing teaching points written on the whiteboard. And I know I will definitely be checking out those PFT links. <laughs> all right, everyone. Have a great night. See you all next time. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye.